Hi, this is Dr. Bear again, and I would like to introduce you to operators. And by way of the Schrodinger equation, we will talk about a very special operator called the Hamiltonian. Here is the list of topics for today. And to begin, we will start with a little bit of a review. Last time, we talked about how we can write a arbitrary state, psi, as a quantum superposition of basis states. So we're going to suppose we have an orthonormal basis denoted by this set of kets here. And we expand psi. And we can also expand its bra psi. Now last time we talked about how we can take ket psi, and if we left multiply it by bra k, we can go through and we can actually select the kth coefficient of this expansion. Similarly, if we have bra psi and we right multiply by ket k, well we can go through and we can extract the kth coefficient again. And so you're seeing here component selection by multiplication with one of the basis bras or kets. So if we want to select the kth ket component, we multiply by bra k, and similarly if we want to get the kth bra component, we multiply by ket k. Okay, so let's now introduce the concept of an outer product. So we talked about inner products last time. Now, if we have an arbitrary psi and chi, we're going to expand psi and chi both in this same basis k. We could have used n, but now k is our integer. And they have coefficients of expansion c for psi and d for chi. The outer product puts the ket of psi and the bra of chi together like this. And that demands this matrix representation. And what happens when we do this, we have a n by 1 times a 1 by n matrix, and we get an n by n matrix. So for the first row, we get C1 multiplied by all of this. So there it is here. And then C2 multiplies the whole row, and Cn multiplies the whole row, like that. And notice D1 is in the entire first column, D2 is in the entire second column, so on. Now let's see how an outer product can be used to transform a quantum state. So let's take our outer product and we'll let it act on an arbitrary ket phi, where phi is of the same Hilbert space as psi and chi. We left multiply phi by this outer product, losing the parentheses chi and phi form an inner product. Now that inner product is nothing more than a scalar, so scalar multiplication commutes. And so we can just swap the scalar with the ket, and we haven't changed anything. So what we've done here is we've transformed the ket phi into a new ket that's proportional to psi with this proportionality factor using this outer product. This outer product is a linear transform from something that's in Hilbert space H to another something in the same Hilbert space. So we'll refer to this object as an operator. And as we noted before, an operator has an n by n matrix representation. And we're just going to recall that when we have this expansion and this matrix representation of our ket psi and our ket phi, well, the individual elements or the individual rows correspond to particular basis kets. Same thing here for ket chi. Okay, so we, let's look again at this outer product. Now you can see that this column, which has d1 in it, corresponds to bra1. The second column with d2 star corresponds to bra2, and so on. The rows then, well, C1 is here, so this corresponds to 
ket1, ket2, and so on. And in this basis, it is pretty evident what the matrix elements are. But let's make it a little bit more explicit. Let's do an example. Let's think about basis kets 1, 2, and 3. We give them this notation here. This is our matrix representation. And we're going to write the operator A in this same basis. Now, if we take the operator a and let it act on ket2, why we are going to get a 3 by 1 column vector. So here's A acting on ket2 and its matrix representation A ket2. 3 by 3 and 3 by 1 give us a 3 by 1. So if you did that matrix algebra, you would see that this ends up extracting the second column of operator A. Similarly, if we used ket3, we would pull out the third column, and ket1, we would pull out the first column. Let's think about row selection. Well, if we left multiply A by bra3, it turns out we pull out the third row. And you can go through the linear algebra of that. Similarly, if we multiplied by bra 2, we get the second row, so on. Well, if we take A acting on 2, and then we're going to left multiply that by the bra 3, well, here's the matrix representation, the result from a couple slides ago, and bra 3 acts on this. Well, we isolate element H. Now notice this is 3 and 2, and what happens is we've selected the third row and the second column. Because remember, uh, the columns represent bras and the rows represent kets, but the way to select a bra is to multiply by a ket, and the way to select a ket component is you multiply by a bra. So we're multiplying by bra 3, we get row 3, which corresponds to ket 3, and we're multiplying by ket2, so we're selecting the component that corresponds to bra2, which is column 2, and so it's element 3, 2, which is h. More generally, you know, we don't have to use the elementary basis. We can use any vectors or any kets that we want, and we can select matrix elements in any basis that we want. So. In general, if we have some operator O, and you put a bra and a ket around it, you're selecting a matrix element. Okay, so if those uh, bra, the bra and the ket, if they correspond one to another, then we refer to that as a diagonal element. So in this case, I've got some basis, and if L is equal to M, then we're referring to a diagonal element, and then non-diagonal elements, of course, will have L not equal to M. Now let's look at the time dependent Schrodinger equation. It takes this form where we have the imaginary number, h bar, the reduced Planck constant, and the derivative of ket psi is equal to the Hamiltonian operator acting on ket psi. This is a very important equation in quantum mechanics. It models the dynamics of a closed system. Therefore, h is a very important operator. The Hamiltonian H describes the energetics of the quantum system. So the Hamiltonian has units of energy, and the diagonal elements of the Hamiltonian are called occupation energies. If we have some basis like this, this diagonal element, JHJ, is the occupation energy of state J. That is, what is the potential energy of the system to be in state J? Now let's talk about the off-diagonal elements. The, the non-diagonal elements, J, H, K, are transition energies from state J to state K. You can think of this as a kinetic energy, the amount by which the system can raise its energy by transitioning or tunneling from J to K. So to make a tunneling event favorable, we actually want a negative value. So sometimes we're going to refer to these as positive numbers, but 
Usually, we want them to enter into the Hamiltonian as a negative number because we want the system to favor or support some kind of tunneling, so it's going to want to lower its energy, therefore we're, we're going to want a negative tunneling energy. Let's calculate the Hamiltonian for this example. So we've got two quantum dots, and we're going to have two states, the one state and the two state. It can occupy either. And we have another fixed electron right here. Now the two dots are separated by distance A, and then the fixed electron is A above dot one only. So let's calculate the Hamiltonian. So we're going to use the site basis, and we're going to use this form. So I specified the hopping energy, and as I said before, we're going to put that in as a negative 50 milli electron volts. And now we just have to calculate the diagonal elements. Remember, the diagonal elements are nothing more than the energies of occupation for those states. So, calculating the occupation energy for the first state, the one state, we say, well, if we have an electron here, what is its electrostatic energy as it interacts with the rest of the system in the environment? The environment is just the one fixed electron, and there's nothing else in the system for it to interact with in terms of there's no other electron on dot two. So this is how that works. It's electrostatics. We have, we're going to assume the charge is on dot one. We're going to use the fundamental charge E, and so it's the charge here times that charge divided by four pi, epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, and the A, the distance between the two. Remember, electronic charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2 coulombs, so I write that as 0.16 attocoulombs, square it, and then here's the permittivity of free space, and the distance A, we said, is 1 nanometer. Okay, one thing I need to point out here is that a coulomb divided by a farad is a volt. So that's how I get 0.23 attovolts here, and then coulombs, and now I'm going to do a conversion where E is one electronic charge. The coulombs cancel, so we get electron volts, and this is a unit of energy. So there is the occupation energy for state one. Similarly, state two can be calculated like this. And so now we have the diagonal elements, and we just update the Hamiltonian. Now, let's demonstrate a calculation of the Hamiltonian in MATLAB. Let's do a different sort of example. Now, instead of two quantum dots, we're going to have n quantum dots. There are no external charges. There's just one electron that can hop between the adjacent dots. We're going to assume it has hopping energy gamma, and we're going to work in the site basis. So let's go to MATLAB now. And here we are in MATLAB now. I'm going to begin by defining the dimension of the system. So we'll set n equal to 7 for now. That's a nice manageable number. We assume that there's one electron. It doesn't have anything else to interact with. No external charges. So what that means here is that we can define the potential energy of that electron to be 0. That's, that's our 0 of energy. So we're going to say h equals zeros and the dimension is n. So if I run that, I'll, well, let's save that first, I suppose. Okay, so I've saved it. Let's run it now. And as we might expect, we get a seven-dimensional square matrix, seven by seven, all zeros. Now, we said that the tunneling energy, gamma, equals 50 milli electron volts. So we write that as 0.05 electron volts, and now we want to put that into the Hamiltonian. Okay, so now we're going to change it a little bit. I've deleted H. We're going to do something else with H now. We're going to use the diag command. So if I use the diag command, and I set, and I give it a row of values, so for example, one, two, three, it gives me a diagonal matrix with those values on the diagonal. In this situation, we want values in the off-diagonal. So 
I can put them in the super diagonal by putting a 1 as the next argument to the diag command. And notice now I get a 4 by 4 matrix, and these elements are in the off diagonal. So that's how we can create our new H. So H is going to be diag, and we're going to put in, remember I want a negative gamma times, and we want this to appear in the off diagonal or the super diagonal, so we're going to say, we're going to put this in as ones, and how many ones do we need? We need one row of them, and it has to have n minus one elements. So if I run that, I get an H that's seven by seven, and then negative 50 millielectron volts in the super diagonal. Now let's look at what that does for a moment. Notice that we have an element here in row one and column two. Well, if you imagine a ket over here that corresponds to the two ket, where it's zero, one, and all the rest are zeros, well, only this row is going to give a non-zero product with that column, and the result is going to show up in element one. So we go from something that's proportional to ket2, and we change it to ket1. Let me just give you an example of how that looks. So let's type psi equals zeros, n rows, one column. I'm going to save that and run that. Here's my psi, seven zeros. Well, that's not a valid state. So we're going to set psi2 equals one. Now that looks like ket2, doesn't that? So watch what happens if we let h act on psi. Now my psi nu, look, uh, we went from psi being proportional to ket2, and now we get something that's proportional to ket1. So our h allows this thing to transition from ket2 to ket1. Uh, we could do the same thing uh, with ket three, whatever, that's because of these off-diagonal elements. It couples ket k to ket and uh, k minus one. Well, we want to add to this Hamiltonian kind of like the same thing, but we need the same gamma values but in the sub-diagonal. So I've added that. Okay, so here's what the h looks like. We've got the superdiagonal and subdiagonal populated. And that's the H that we wanted for this example right here. In another video, I'm going to show you how we can use the H, and we can use the Hamiltonian to calculate the time evolution, and we can calculate the stationary states. Those are all very important things in quantum mechanics. So we introduced the concept of an operator and the very important Hamiltonian operator by way of the Schrodinger equation. Next time we'll talk a little more about the Schrodinger equation and how we can apply the Hamiltonian that we showed you how to create in this video. As always, if you found this video to be helpful, uh, please like it, share it, share the channel, and look out for upcoming videos also. Here are some links to other videos that I've created. Thanks for watching and have a great day.